Good afternoon, it's Monday the 10th of October 2016, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. Well, just imagine if you lived in California, you'd be saying, not another sunny day, which is exactly what we've got here in Plymouth. Blue sky sunshine, really quite lovely. Uh, but a mixed bag across the country, which is, of course, why we like talking about the weather so much. So we've got rain in Norfolk and Lincoln. We've got gloom in rugby. Uh, London is overcast, uh, but Pembrokeshire and indeed Holland have got some sunshine as well. So there we are. Well, we're kicking off with, uh, with Yemen. <clears throat> and uh, we've got a little bit of video there showing uh, the aftermath of the latest attack by Saudi warplanes. 140 people killed. Uh, this time they decided they would uh, target a funeral, Brian. Really pleasant of them. Uh, this was the funeral of the father of the interior ministry of the uh, interim Yemeni government. government. Um, so this is the aftermath of that. As I say, 140 people killed. Um, but it's, uh, it's quite fine because uh, Tobias Elwood, the minister for the Middle East, well, he said, uh, we urge all sides to recommit to political talks and to implement a cessation of hostilities. He said he was deeply concerned by the reports of an airstrike hitting a funeral hall in the Yemeni capital, Sana'a, yesterday. Uh, the scenes on, from the site are shocking. Uh, he said there can be no military solution to this conflict. We urge all sides to recommit to political talks and implement a cessation of hostility. So um, no military solution to this conflict. But in the meantime, Saudi Arabia remains a valued customer, Brian, for British arms and munitions. Well, that's true. But perhaps we could also say, was Britain um, providing the targeting uh, data, Mike? It just might be that I-Star, of course, they made a bit of a blunder in Syria, which uh, was part of the death of 64, at least 64 uh, members of the Syrian armed forces. Could it just be that that same um, British military outfit has been providing the Saudis with targeting information? And this, of course, is one of the things that we don't actually know at the moment. Um, Britain doesn't formally go to war. We simply have um, politicians telling the military what the next target is. So there's there's some really serious questions here. My, I, I'm I'm being um, uh, what's the word? I'm being darkly sarcastic in answering that question. But the real uh, the real thing is that it's quite possible that indeed British military intelligence has been providing the targeting. Right. Well, um, we reported back in August that uh, Tobias Elwood uh, had been meeting with John Kerry and the Saudi and Saudi royalty uh, to discuss Yemen and uh, prospects for the British arms trade while the conflict continues. Um, but uh, let's just get, give a little bit of uh, sort of context to this, because uh, back in February, when Philip Hammond uh, was foreign secretary, he's now chancellor of the Exchequer, of course, when he was foreign secretary back in uh, February, he said... Uh, he made a very conclusive statement. He said, we have assessed, this is the Foreign Office, we have assessed that there has not been a breach of international humanitarian law by the Saudi-led coalition at that stage. Um, but unfortunately, he had to retract that statement or at least change it slightly because in uh, July, the Foreign Office said, uh, well, I mean, uh, we have not assessed that there has been a breach of international humanitarian law by the Saudi-led coalition. So that's quite a different. Uh, state of affairs. One is a definitive statement that the Saudis have not breached humanitarian uh, law. And the other saying, well, we haven't actually made any kind of assessment, but it didn't end there. Um, because in June this year, uh, Philip Hammond said the MOD assessment is that the Saudi-led coalition is not targeting civilians. And also in July, then they had to retract that as well. And they said uh, the MOD has not assessed that the Saudi-led coalition is targeting civilians. So in both cases, um, it went from a definitive statement that uh, the Saudis were not doing anything wrong uh, to having to change that to be, well, actually, we haven't done the assessment at all. Um, and uh, So that gives the plausible deniability, as I think it's called there. But the essence is that either our politicians are grossly uh, ill-informed or else they're just uh, prepared to lie point blank to the British public. Actually, I, I believe it's the latter, Mike. But we get the idea. Well, here, here's what they said. Then the Foreign Office said, uh, we regularly encourage Saudi Arabia to investigate any allegations of breaches of international humanitarian law, which are attributed to them 
and for their investigations to be thorough and conclusive. Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia has publicly stated that it is investigating reports of alleged violations and that any lessons learned will be acted upon. We continue to believe that they have the best insight into their own military opera, uh, procedures, allowing them to understand what went wrong and apply the lessons learned in the best possible way, if required. Uh, this is the standard we set ourselves and our allies. For example, when allegations have been made against us in Afghanistan and Iraq, we have investigated these claims ourselves. We did not expect other states to do this and form judgments on our behalf. So there you go, Brian. Uh, because we do it, it's quite all right for the rest of the world to do it too. The arrogance is unbelievable, isn't it? We, we make the mistakes, we kill, kill the civilians, then the British government's going to investigate itself and we're going to find that we did nothing wrong and that's what we learn. And then we carry on with the same procedure, Chilcot being the best example of the lot. Uh, but we'll say again, of course, Britain involved in the deaths of those Syrian army um, troops. As a result, um, it, it would appear of a targeting mistake. But I believe they've already had an investigation into the military side controlling the drones. And they say, well, of course, um, nothing went wrong. So we just kill people uh, on the decision of politicians. No debate in Westminster. And then if anybody points a finger, uh, the same politicians have an investigation and say, we didn't do anything wrong. But it's all right for us, so it must be all right for our allies as well. So Saudi Arabia can just go ahead and investigate themselves. Indeed. Right. So um, and let's not forget that a couple of weeks ago, the leaked report uh, was the beginning of September, the leaked report from the Committee on Arms Exports Controls. Um, this is 16 MPs made up from four different parties. And they said the weight of evidence of violations of international humanitarian law by the Saudi-led coalition is now so great that it is very difficult to continue to support Saudi Arabia. Um, it doesn't matter, though, because the government signed off £3.3 .3 billion pounds of arms exports to Saudi Arabia, uh, and uh, that includes £2.2 .2 billion uh, pounds worth of ML-10 licenses, which is drones, helicopters, other aircraft like that. Uh, and, uh, well... Discussions, as re was reported uh, just a day or two ago, discussions between BAE Systems, uh, BAE Systems, sorry, the UK government and Saudi Arabia are progressing. We're working to define the scope and terms of the next five years Saudi-British Defence Cooperation Programme. Uh, bearing in mind the atrocities that Saudi Arabia has committed in Yemen over the last year or two, um, and uh, the fact that, you know, British, the British government has taken this arrogant stance on it uh, and said, we don't really care. Um, I don't see that uh, this latest atrocity at attacking a funeral is going to make uh, any difference to this uh, Saudi-British defence cooperation programme. Uh, none at all, because it's, it's just big money. And of course, um, just like uh, David Cameron disappeared out to Egypt immediately after the troubles out there, um, complete with the arms team for sales. And then we've just had uh, Prince Charles, of course, um, also going over to visit the Saudis as part of a warm up for more arms deals. And uh, just as an aside, I understand that Prince Charles will be taking a major part in the development of the new town just outside of Plymouth and that he's received some thirty four million pounds of um, government money in order to take a lead in that development. So it seems to be finely balanced. Uh, Mike at home, he's there as the uh, caring prince helping to build new towns. It'll be Poundbury Mark II, no doubt. And overseas will be pounding the people we don't like. Mm. Uh, well, let's contrast the uh, reality of the uh, killing of people overseas by the military industrial compact complex with comments north of the border. Now, this came out over the weekend. It's from the Scotsman, uh, Mary Black, SNP, who said the Tory policies were reminiscent of Nazi Germany. Now, whilst we might agree with that in the first instance, the uh, key thing was in the comments underneath, because uh, one of the people who'd commented on this article was pointing out that, uh, of course, it was the very same SNP which was actually proposing to set up a quizzling government with the Nazis should they succeed in invading uh, during the Second World War. So we're going to stick with that because we understand that there's quite a lot of information around the somewhat murky background of the SNP, but it's pretty classic to see the sheer hypocrisy 
from what appears to be a fiefdom dictatorship north of the border. Um, lost for words, Mike, I think, on that one. Now, we, we have started off, of course, with the death of people overseas as a result of uh, British political policy. Um, we've just given that snapshot of perhaps what's happening north of the border. But what we're seeing in the country altogether, of course, is people's minds being taken off um, the serious topics into a variety of sidelines. And this was uh, flagged up again over the weekend by several people. Now, it's going back a few months, but uh, we just wanted to say, let's really think about this. Uh, the story was that the mayor of London uh, had agreed that the little symbols in traffic crossings could be made LGBT friendly. So instead of having the little crossing man, uh, they were going to show specialised images. So this was the... Um, uh, the comment in the Sky report, lights at Trafalgar Square's pedestrian crossings are set to permanently change to display a range of gay and transgender symbols instead of the traditional uh, green man. And that's just one of the symbols that they were going to, uh, that they were actually putting up. Uh, but of course, what we're looking at here is subliminal reframing of people. This is drifting this stuff into the subconscious and of course a particular target of this uh, will be children. So make of that what you will but uh, while the deaths are mounting up overseas uh, what are we supposed to be doing at home? Largely bread and circuses. But there's some other rather unpleasant stuff coming to the surface. This, been, this has been reported quite widely uh, across the uh, press and media but um, clowns have been popping up on the streets. Uh, clearly terrorising people. Adults have said that when these uh, um, clowns appeared, for example, peering in their car windows or draped across the body of the car or in subways during the night or early hours of the morning, as adults they were frightened. So what the effect was on children uh, will be very interesting to know. But this is the significant factor. These sightings have been popping up all over the country. Manchester, County Durham, Plymouth's even had them. Newcastle, Liverpool, Dundee, Sheffield, Leeds, Essex, Carnarvon. And uh, a phenomena has also appeared, similar phenomena in the States. I've just put here, motorists frightened um, a, a man and children were terrified who came across these individuals. Um, is it connected? Stephen King, director of the film It, with Pennywise the Dancing Clown, the demonic shape-shifting entity, played down the sightings on Twitter. He said, well, these are just clowns and everybody likes clowns. Uh, but actually, the Mail article, interestingly enough, produced a university report that said when 250 children were asked whether they like clowns, they said they found them extremely frightening. And uh, the paper also pointed out that Warner Brothers just happened to be producing a new film version of the film It. So something very sinister here. Um, is this just an accident that we got people spread across the country deciding to dress up as clowns and frighten people? Or is there some sort of psychological operation being unleashed? Well, I think it's first and foremost uh, promotion for the movie. Uh, and I think it's, it's pretty... Uh... It's pretty dark the way that it's being done, uh, and uh, it's you know it, it, it sounds like, and I don't know this for sure, but it sounds like um, there there's other strange behaviour going on, or at least the, it's under the cover of this. There seems to be other strange behaviour going on involving children, which which is never pleasant. Uh, not pleasant at all, and of course some of this stuff is capable of really scaring children, perhaps for life. But at the moment, what I can't see is, is any real effort by the police actually to track down who these individuals are or to start asking the serious questions as to where this is coming from. Mm. So what, what have we got? We've got a destabilising phenomena which is creeping across the country. Right, tonight, uh, live programmes, 7.30pm, uh, Humanity versus Insanity, uh, in entitled this one, Death of Democracy, uh, and then at 9pm, Fracking Nightmare, uh, he's entitled that one, uh, Sajid Javid, Frackwit Explo Exposed, uh, and he will have a couple of guests on for that, Bob Dennett and Ebony Johnson, and they're from Blackpool. Uh, clearly the main focus of uh, Fracking Nightmare tonight, the 
decision by the UK government to override uh, local democracy, which is, I think, is a perfect demonstration of the point that we've been making, Brian, with regard to devolution. Devolution is supposed to be putting the power in the hands of local people. Uh, and our point has been, uh, oh, no, it's not that at all. It is, in fact, centralised control of local people. Um, and this is a perfect example of it because the central government just decided to override um, local, uh, the local democratic choice, uh, which was to prevent fracking in uh, Lanc Lancashire. Um, and they've uh, overridden that and it's going to go ahead. So uh, that'll be the main focus tonight. OK, excellent. Well, we'll give the people a reminder, the 19th of November, the British Constitution Group meeting in Winchester, which is about reasserting the proper rule of law. And uh, I'm going to say British Constitution Group is now at the point of saying Britain has become lawless. We've got a complete breakdown of law and order. Uh, the courts are not working properly. We are not seeing the true power of the jury at work within in courts. We're seeing star chambers run by uh, judiciary or magistrates. And um, of course, we need to get the proper rule of law under common law and juries re reinstated. And we also need to get our country taking full control of the money supply, which is uh, largely focused around the Bradbury pound. But of course, there's um, much debate over the role of the criminal uh, international banking system. Now, one of the parts of our uh, society which has taken a very big hit as a result of privatisation is the NHS. And uh, I have been invited to do a talk about the NHS at the Lugger uh, Inn in Penzance. This is this coming Saturday, the 15th of October. And um, uh, basically, uh, there's, there's also Patrick Quanton, who's going to be talking from... Um, a doctor's point of view as to what's going on inside the so-called care system. Um, but uh, this is a major issue now with local MP Gary Streeter, for example, saying he regards any talk about the intent to privatise the NHS as um, conspiracy theory. Yeah. OK, military stuff then. Um, Operation Albanian Lion, Brian. 2,300 UK maritime forces taking part in an exercise with Albania. Uh, Royal Navy and Royal Marines personnel uh, and uh, annual deployment apparently of a crisis-focused uh, amphibious task group, the Joint Expeditionary Force Maritime 16. Uh, several Royal Navy ships uh, playing a role in this, uh, including HMS Ocean and HMS Bulwark. Uh, and uh, well, what did uh, Michael Fallon have to say about it? The contribution of maritime forces as well as two Royal Navy warships underlines the UK's strength at sea uh, and our strong defence partnership with Albania. Um, so you were asking whether perhaps this was being done under the auspices of the European Union? Got to do some work on it, Mike, but I think this is uh, one of the key, <coughs> excuse me, one of the key questions. Is this actually a UK Albanian exercise, or is it a UK Albanian exercise which is being done under the control of the European Union? Uh, one of the reasons we might suspect that, of course, is that this, this area is well within the area that the EU said was of interest. So, uh, is this going through a normal Royal Navy command and control structure, or is it actually being run by the uh, EU? We don't know, but we're going to have a look into that. Of course, if, if it is the European Union, then we've got more evidence that Brexit is a complete and utter lie. And uh, the game at the moment is for rapid uh, military inter integration uh, with the creation of the European Treasury. That was one of the key points uh, that David Ellis was making the other day when he was talking about this. So it's remarkable. We don't have any money. We haven't got enough money for our own equipment, but suddenly we've got money for deployment of British troops everywhere into Eastern Europe, into Albania. Um, why is this happening? Why isn't it debated in Westminster? We don't know. But I think I've got an idea as to yeah. why. OK, well, same, <coughs> excuse me, same rule applies. Uh, we have these very serious things happening overseas. What is the public being fed at the moment? Now, several people pointed this um, particular article from the Independent out to me. 
This is not new. This is, uh, this is going back quite a while. But for whatever reason, it was picked up and I decided to follow this story through. So here is the independent and the headline is the diary of a teenage girl uh, star Belle Powley. And she says we're not promoting underage sex in the film. Well, the film was um, uh, was in the independent because basically the filmmakers were saying it's grossly unfair, but the, the board of um, censors have said they're going to put an 18 rating on this film, although similar films, The Fish Tank and The Reader, uh, similar storylines of underage sex were both given a 15 rating. So let's think what The Independent's doing here. It's promoting a film which is about underage sex, and then it's strongly putting across the idea that uh, an 18 rating is unfair and we should reduce it to the age that young teenagers can see it, which gives a double advantage if you are promoting um, underage sex. So uh, this is part of the comment by uh, the directors. Now, the article makes bigger the fact that this film was put together by uh, female directors and filmmakers. And they were upset that an all male panel of censors said it'd got to have an 18 certificate. Um, but Marielle Heller here says the media has endlessly told teenage girls the boys are the only ones who are going to want sex. Girls are going to be the ones that don't want it. Nobody tells a girl what it's like if you want to have sex. So this is a promotion of sex in young teenagers, particularly young girls. And that's from director of Caviar Films. Now, Caviar Films only gets one mention in the whole of the article, so we decided to go and have a look at them. And uh, as always, we encourage our readers and uh, our viewers and listeners to go and have a look yourself, uh, because if you go and look at the sort of films they're producing, you very quickly find yet more films promoting underage sex. So we've, uh, we've got the film Bo here from Caviar Films, all about a 15-year-old girl entering prostitution. And the film clips are pretty graphic, um, not only from a sexual point of view, but very dark, uh, depressing material all around a 15-year-old girl. Uh, this is another one, Nymphomaniac, Caviar Films, Woman's Erotic Journey from Birth to Age 50. So there's no mistaking the type of material that's being pushed. And of course, the independent didn't bother to do any analysis on what type of film company would want to put this material through. But the story gets better uh, because let's bring in this lady, Phoebe Gluckner, and she was the original author of the um, novel Diary of a Teenage Girl. So this is the book that's been used to produce the film. And if we go and have a look at her, she specializes uh, in being a medical illustrator and fiction publisher. Uh, she illustrated the atrocity exhibition where she used clinical images of internal anatomy together with sex and physical trauma in what was described as an ambiguous and evocative combination. So this is very, very dark uh, material. And of course, it's all around uh, teenage sex. Uh, her book, A Child's Life and Other Stories, was described by the mayor of Stockton, California, as a how-to book, a how-to book for paedophiles. And of course, the independent here is simply drifting in a drive for the normalization of underage sex, which is child abuse. Well, by an amazing coincidence, we were sent uh, uh, several pieces of information, and one of which was this from the mail. This appears to be a different story. I'm a feminist, but I want a romantic man to woo and cherish me inside the head of Gizi Erskine. I've no real idea who this lady is, um, but what I've seen so far, I don't get a particularly uh, nice feeling about her. So let's have a look at what she says in this article. Uh, she said who uh, she was asked who uh, would be your dream dinner date. I'm fascinated by Alastair Crowley. That's the Satanist Alastair Crowley. I'm fascinated by Crowley, the occult sociopath's hedonism, uh, the bacchanalian attitude 
he had is how I look at the world. Well, that was near the start, but this is the bit that particularly interested me because when she was asked the last film she'd seen, she said teenage diaries about a girl groomed by her stepdad. It paints a horrific subject in a very different light. So here we've got the actual information um, that basically, so I'll bring it up on the top of the screen. It should come up for me now. Um, she knows exactly what the film is about. It's about grooming an underage girl for sex. So the male is reporting the truth, but the independent is hiding it. And what I've done there is highlighted in the photograph um, that this uh, lovely lady seems to be tattooing a piece of meat. And in the back, tucked behind her mirror, is a nice little picture of Satan. So I'm not sure what the uh, Daily Mail is up to here, Mike, but uh, it seems that we've got another article uh, where promotion of uh, child abuse has drifted in by the mainstream media. And we better stay on the Daily Mail because um, it gets easier and easier to see what's going on. Here's the Mail article. What really happens at a porn shoot, a behind the scenes glimpse into the filming of an X rated movie. And uh, this is by journalist Gareth May from Metro. So this is what he says, that he's been a fan of porn ever since he can remember. But recently, porn has undergone a bit of a public image facelift. No longer the scrubby little industry on the edge of acceptability. The adult biz has inched closer to the mainstream. Well, of course it has, because the Daily Mail is now directly happy to uh, be advertising a pornographic film. This was one of his other comments in that article. He said, I wouldn't be told where I was going. All I was allowed to do was get in the car with Santos, heading into the countryside, and hope that I wasn't going to be dragged into the bushes and murdered. This is what happens to perverts when they acquire about visiting porn sets. Now, this is a pretty interesting statement because it starts to give you an idea in what this stuff is really about. But let's remember that this whole article promoting a pornographic film is on the Daily Mail's website, totally accessible to um, children, Mike. So um, what were the sorts of comments? Well, I'm pleased to say that if you had a look at some of the public comments, there were a lot of them. Uh, that were of this ilk, which is, this is pathetic. Of course it's pathetic. It's the mail online, for goodness <laughs> sake. So we can say that the public are, are seeing through this, uh, but of course it's not so much pathetic as a calculated attack on the public mind and uh, children in particular. So we better reinforce that by bringing up little John. Uh, here he is. A number of people watching this man very carefully because he has constantly been demeaning investigations into child abuse. And I'd like to thank the lady who pointed this out to us. So this is from his, his page. I think it was August this year. It says a Russian woman has complained to the police that she was raped by a Pokemon Go character. It's a little bit in line with your comments earlier, Mike, when we were talking about the. Um, clowns. Uh, wait until Scotland Yard hears about this. The Met will set up a special Pokemon squad, appeal for victims to come forward, and promise that all allegations will be treated as credible and true. I think this gives us a fascinating insight into what must be a particularly unpleasant man, that he's prepared to laugh at a rape victim uh, would he laugh at a woman who was raped by one of those clowns, for example? But of course, underneath, what, he's, what is he doing? He's laughing at anybody who comes forward and says that they were abused as a child. So we focused on the mail there, but it seems the Daily Mail has now gone fully over the edge to Red Top, uh, where it's pornography and get people off the serious stuff. Right. Uh, Pretty Patel, we mentioned her last week. Um, she's talking about the World Bank. Uh, and, uh, well, she's uh, actually in, or was at the end of last week, in uh, the United States uh, for the World Bank annual meetings. Uh, and she was really saying that they've got to do more in terms of uh, aid, because they're not doing enough in terms of international aid. 
Uh, she, of course, is the International uh, Development Secretary. Uh, she's challenging and changing the global aid system. Apparently, it's not just uh, free trade that we are dealing with, with Global Britain, the new hashtag. Uh, as far as the government concerned, it's hashtag Global Britain. Uh, everything is globalised in Britain, uh, which makes another mockery of Brexit, by the way, but that's another discussion. Uh, so she's going to change the global aid system to ensure it effectively serves the poorest people around the world, she says, while delivering value for money for UK taxpayers. Um, so the World Bank, she said, uh, has the reach and expertise to boost developing economies, but it must work harder and smarter to help end aid de dependency sorry, and achieve maximum impact for UK taxpayers. And of course, what she's talking about, she's talking about this money. Uh, being pushed into the NGO sector um, right across the world. Now, um, so we, this is probably a Soros uh, <clears throat> initiative, do you think, Mike? Well, um, I think Soros is, is part of this, but, but uh, this is certainly part of British foreign policy, um, that huge amount of mon amounts of money should be going into uh, NGOs, white helmets being just one example of, the, of that. Uh, but we, we see the activities of various uh, polit politically controlled and weaponized uh, NGOs um, right around the world and uh, really what she's saying is that uh, national aid budgets um, are not sufficient to achieve the change agenda that she wants to see so she wants the World Bank and the IMF to start uh, pushing in that direction as well. Yeah. Now, Royal Bank of Scotland here we go, nice organisation um, now in mid-September um, we highlighted this article companies hurt by RBS pursue the regulator uh, and this uh, has come because, of course, well, the article it said, itself said hundreds of businesses are threatening the city regular, regulator with legal action because of delays to a long-awaited report into the activities of Royal Bank of Scotland's restructuring unit. Now, of course, 12, over 12,000 companies were pushed into the Global Restructuring Group, GRG, following the 2007-2008 uh, crash. Uh, and uh, uh, what, they, what the article was pointing out was that between 2007 and 2012, the value of loans uh, that were taken on by GRG from the main uh, RBS bank uh, increased to £65 billion. Um, and, uh, well, the, F, the, foreign, uh, sorry, the financial, financial Conduct Authority uh, was supposed to be running uh, an investigation into this. It's been going on for a long time. Uh, and... Uh, the, company that they, the companies that they employed to do this investigation actually reported about two years ago on it, but they has, they're just they're holding it back. It's like Chilcot, really, in many ways. Um, well, today, uh, what was interesting is that BuzzFeed News um, managed to get a package uh, from a whistleblower full of documents and emails on this issue, uh, and uh, they've entitled it The Dash for Cash because uh, the... Uh, it was described by the RBS whistleblower as the project for the project dash for cash, um, and uh, so let's have a look at some of the things that they were saying. RBS managers encouraged employees to hunt for ways to boost their bonuses by forcing customers into loan restructuring in order to extract heavy fees as part of a profit named nickname project dash for cash. Firms that had never missed a loan payment were pushed into GRG under the bank's secret policies for reasons that had nothing to do with financial distress including for telling RBS they wanted to leave the bank, falling out with managers or threatening to sue over mistreatment. Uh, once in GRG, firms were hit with crippling fees, fines and interest rate hikes that could run into seven figures, helping to net the restructuring unit a profit of more than a billion pounds in a single year. And that was in 2011. Um, and uh, contrary to claims by the bank, there were no Chinese walls between GRG and West Register bosses. Uh, who sat together on both the controlling committee that held committees that uh, held sway over which businesses were transferred into the restructuring unit and the property acquisition committee that signed off the bank's bids for distressed assets. Auditors repeatedly warned about perceived conflicts of interest in GRG. Auditors, by the way, also repeatedly warned about the potential uh, impact on uh, uh, RBS's uh, long-term uh, at least the public perception of, of RBS as a bank. It goes on to say the property division, which amassed assets worth £3.3 .3 billion pounds during the crisis, was passed information that was not available to other bidders when it wanted to acquire properties from businesses in GRG. 
In contrast to what RBS executives told Parliament, properties could, uh, could be sold to West Register without being advertised on the op open market. And finally, staff were told to conceal conflicts of interest from customers when demanding cheap, uh, cheap shares in their businesses or stakes in their properties. So this is all about asset stripping. Um, and of course, this was all dealt with a number of years ago by the Tomlinson Report. Um, and uh, nothing seems to have moved on from this. Now, um, we uh, have an ep episode of Inside Vox. It's available on the UK Column membership uh, website at the moment uh, with an interview that you did uh, a couple of months ago with Colm Canning. Um, we showed it on the live stream a couple of weeks ago, but if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, please watch it because Colm, of course, was uh, a senior uh, manager at Ulster Bank, which is a subsidiary of uh, RBS. He left Ulster Bank um, because he re basically refused to carry out this type of asset stripping that the bank was demanding of him. Um, and uh, in that interview, he describes exactly the types of things that had been uh, discussed in the, uh, in the leaks on BuzzFeed News. Go and have a look at the BuzzFeed News website uh, for that report. Go and have a look at uh, the Inside Vox episode with Colm Canning, um, because unless there's public pressure on RBS uh, and on the government in particular and the Financial C uh, Conduct Authority, this issue is not going to move ahead. People lost their businesses. People lost their homes their marriages um, as a result of uh, what happened with RBS. It's all going to happen again, as we'll come on to in a second, unless uh, people uh, sort of demand some proper action on it. And uh, we can say well done, of course, to uh, Colm Canning here, because uh, this is exactly the sort of individual that's needed inside the system, people who are prepared to blow the whistle and to get the truth out about what's really going on. What has happened to him since he's done that, of course, is the first important thing is no action whatsoever by the police uh, to investigate and start to bring what is, what is fraud and corruption to a halt. And uh, similarly, the court system simply not interested. Why is that? Well, it is, of course, because senior police officers and the court system itself, um, both those um, both those uh, organisations, the police and the courts, are involved in the in the ring of corruption, and uh, I think we're going to be getting more information on this, particularly from uh, Northern Ireland. Um, I heard a rumour Colin might be speaking at the BCG conference. Is that Indeed, correct? he is. Yeah. Excellent. So Colin Canning will be speaking, as Mike's reminded me, at the British Constitution Group conference on the nineteenth of uh, November. So that is another one of the excellent speakers. Uh, that uh, we hope you will come and, and hear. Um, well, pretty much since the 2007-2008 crash, uh, we have been warning that that was only going to be the, uh, the sort of pre-shock. Um, and uh, while the uh, shenanigans of the various central banks have managed to, at least uh, on the surface, uh, kept the financial system afloat over the last few years, <clears throat> finally, uh, mainstream media actually starting to talk about this financial crash 2016. This is from the Daily Star. Economic meltdown imminent and British ta taxpayers could foot the bill. Uh, another punishing financial crisis worse than 2008 is looming and hard up British taxpayers could be forced to foot the bill. Financial experts have warned uh, and if they go on to discuss Deutsche Bank. Uh, last month, Deutsche Bank was te teetering on the brink of collapse after shares plunged to a 30 uh, year low. Economic experts believe the German mega bank will bounce back despite slashing a thousand jobs over worries about its financial situation. But the consequences of the bank folding could be disastrous. Experts believe heralding the downfall of the global banking system as we know it. Um, well, of course, it can't uh, stay up based on what uh, the policies that they have implemented over the last few years. Uh, whether it happens uh, before Christmas or not is is uh, a big question, but. Um, there is no question we are going to see a Lehman's type event. Something is going to trigger. Deutsche Bank may well be the trigger for it. And the Financial Times really hinting about um, how desperate they are to uh, keep Deutsche Bank afloat um, and sort of hide uh, the uh, difficulties that it's in. This is the FT today pointing out that, that Deutsche Bank was given special treatment in the European Union's bank stress tests. Uh, and what they're saying is that, uh, of course, Deutsche Bank is still facing a fine of up to $14 billion uh, in the United States. Uh, but the FT learned that uh, the stress test result was boosted by a special concession uh, 
uh, where basically they put four billion dollars of proceeds on their books uh, for a, for a trade uh, for a, a selling a stake in uh, a Chinese financial organization called YZ. YZ um, I can't even pronounce it, so we'll just move on. It's Chinese. Uh, it's Chinese, yeah. Uh, and uh, that deal has not been done still, even though we're now almost two years since those stress tests were done. Uh, but they were allowed to put that $4 billion on their books. Uh, and so um, they got special treatment in that respect. The, the, the sale was agreed in December 2015. Um, but in fact, uh, all that they have said is that it's likely to be closed by 2016. In the meantime, there been delay after delay, and it actually doesn't look like it's going to happen. So Deutsche Bank, actually, their balance sheet in significantly worse condition than, than, than was uh, uh, popularly recognized, um, and the EU um, giving them special dispensation to effectively lie. Special dispensation means fiddling the books, permission to fiddle the books in order to commit fraud as part of international corrupt, corruption in the banking industry. Indeed. But we don't want anybody being arrested for that. We don't certainly don't want anybody going to prison. It's a fine which um, doesn't really hurt anybody concerned, I believe. So that's how that, <laughs> we've just <laughs> described the system. We're now chuckling because we don't know what else to say. Uh, it is getting increasingly obvious um, that uh, we've got major collapse on its way. We've got a complete and utter breakdown of law and order inside UK. We've got British politicians who think they can simply walk on a world stage, creating wars and violence wherever they choose. It's up to us whether this continues or the wider British public saying, no, we're not having it. We need to get the uh, true rule of law reinstated, re reasserted. If you're wondering what you can personally do, then we always say speak out, talk to people, gather together some like-minded people around you. It's building up networks of information where the truth is spreading is the important thing. And we're delighted to say that the uh, networks that have been around the British Constitution Group are not only coming back to life, but expanding. We need to get the truth out there, and every little bit that you can do ultimately makes a big difference. So if you haven't got the 19th of November booked, uh, please get that in your diary. And remember, of course, the tickets are cheaper if you buy them up front uh, via the website. That's it for today. We will be back at the same time tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.